Shalom, my friends. In response to many requests, I'm giving a short share on this week's Parsha. We have, we finished the book of Ayikra, and we read the last two portions of it. It's a double portion called Bahar Bechukaisai. And at the conclusion, as I say, we finished the book of Ayikra, and we'll start the book of Bamidbar. The Torah begins with an unusual statement, and God spoke to Mesha on Mount Sinai, saying, and it goes into the laws of Shemitah and Yovel. The laws of Shemitah is that every seven years, the farmers, most of the Jews in Israel at that time were farmers, would have to allow their lands to lie fallow. And uh, for the entire seventh year, that year they were in perhaps a kind of a lockdown, not exactly a lockdown, but they couldn't work. And they would spend that year in spiritual matters. That's uh, the law of uh, Schmitte, that they couldn't work their field. They can only collect that which grew on its own naturally. But that didn't belong to them personally. It belonged to everybody. Everyone in Israel was free to take. There was no such thing, I guess, as a private property. Everyone was free to take it, not only humans, but even wild animals and others uh, can, can take it. That's the law of Shmita. Then the law goes into Yevil, the Jubilee year. And that is that they would count seven series of Shmita, which would make it the 49 years. And the 49th year would be a Shmita year that they couldn't work. And then would come the 50th year, the year of Yevil. That year, you couldn't work either, but not only that, also your fields went back to the original owners. Uh, slaves, which they had in those days, were set free, etc., which means as follows. You know, today, if I have a family farm for many generations and I get into a difficulty and I can't make the payments, the bank could take it over, someone could take it at a very cheap rate, and then that farm is lost to that family for all its future generations. The Torah didn't like that idea, so the Torah said if you were forced to sell your farm, or for whatever reason you did sell it, you couldn't sell a farm in those days in perpetuity. You could only lease it and you could lease it up to the Yovel year. So the maximum could have been uh, 50 years if you, if you leased it out on year one. But if you leased it out on 20, year 25, then the purchaser did not have it for another 50 years, but rather he had it up to year 50 Yovel. The minimum you could buy it was two years. So you could only sell it uh, in year 48, and then it would go back in 50. But what would come out is that the farmer wouldn't work for two years in a row. He wouldn't end up working on year 48, uh, 49 or on year 50. So the Torah says that the person may be, uh, wonder, if I don't work for two years, how am I going to survive? What am I going to live from? So Hashem says, don't worry about it. I promise you that on the sixth year or the 48th year, your produce will give you enough to last you until the produce comes in of the 51st year. I will command my blessing. These are some of the laws of Shemitah and Yova. Now, the Kliyakar uh, discusses what is the rationale for the law of Shemitah not to work the field. And he says there are some who try and find a natural, rational reason for the law. And they say that during the first six years, you are taking out the nutrients of all the ground. And so, therefore, 
it makes sense to allow the ground to remain fallow for the seventh year. In that way, it regains its nutrients, it replenishes itself, and so then it could carry on giving crops for another six years. But the Cleoka says that that reason doesn't hold water. In fact, he proves it from the following. Because what does the Torah say is going to happen on the sixth year? It's going to give enough crops to last you for two years. And then you'll only in the eighth year when you grow again, will you need food because your granaries will be full from the sixth year. Similarly, on the 48th year, it's going to give you enough crops for 49, 50, and until you get the crops from 51. So he says if it's being deteriorated, the ground, so the sixth year should give you less than the first year, not more. And the 48th year obviously should give you even less. And yet the Torah promises you that it'll be the opposite. So you have to come out that the reason for the Shemitah is our faith in God Almighty. That it is not just our hard work and our efforts that gain us blessings, but rather it is obeying and following God Almighty's words. And this is a very important lesson to us in every aspect of life. I remember in the 1980s, I haven't heard it so much lately, but in, when I first started our shul, we had many people who would come and say, Rabbi, I can come Friday night to shul, but Shabbos morning is very difficult. And the reason for that is, it's my best day at work. What do you want me to do? And see, oh, if I don't work on Shabbos, I won't make enough for the whole week. And this was similar to those who questioned about what Schmidt is all about. And the answer is have faith in God Almighty. And by keeping his words, he will guarantee you that you will have it. One of the examples was uh, It's and Monty Arenstein, the Arenstein brothers that started a very famous car, uh, car dealership. And everybody said to them, you won't make it if you close on Shabbos. That's when everyone buys their cars. They didn't listen. They kept Shabbos. And in fact, they were very, very successful. And that is true in many of our laws, which rationale seems to be saying that you can't do it without it. And yet we manage. For example, giving tzedakah. The Torah tells us we should give 10% of our earnings to charity, a minimum of 10%. There are many people who think that goes against rationale. I barely make enough to end, make ends meet. If I give tzedakah, how am I going to have enough for myself? And yet the Torah says, that is the way you do it. It is by giving your tzedakah that you elicit, you bring down God Almighty's blessings and you get more. As someone said, I shovel out some of mine, but I have a small shovel. And as I shovel out, God shovels in. And his shovel is a lot bigger than mine. That is the way God set up the world with the laws of Schmidt and Yovel. And then the Torah goes on to tell us that if you buy, sell a home, you're forced to sell a home in a war, walled city. So you have 12 months to redeem it. If you can get back your money within 12 months, uh, then you can buy back the house. And if the person leaves town before it, you just deposit the money with the Beth Din and you take back your house. The Torah is a capitalistic system, but with sympathy, empathy, and understanding for others and the poor. And so it has certain aspects of socialistic laws. The Torah also goes into the laws of not taking interest and the laws of which in those days had slavery. And then we come to the second portion, the portion of Bechukesai. Bechukesai contains, first of all, the opening is that if you follow God's rules and work hard in studying Torah and observe his mitzvot, then he promises us many, many 
blessings, including that there will be rain, there'll be plentiful produce, your threshing will last and, and you will eat just a little bit and already you will be satisfied. You will have um, peace. There won't be any, any wild animals, which is also referring to after Mashiach's times, and there'll be tremendous, tremendous blessings. Whereas if, God forbid, you don't, then it's called the Teichacha. The rebuke will follow, and we have here a list of 49 what they call rebukes, curses, that will befall the Jewish nation if we don't obey God. And that is actually what happened. But talking about blessings, the Talmud asks, Schar mitzvah bahai al moleka. There is no reward in this world for mitzvahs. So what does it mean by these blessings? And the Rambam tells us that we should realize these are not re, uh, rewards for the blessings. But what is it like if I hire, for example, someone to paint my home and he tells me how much money he needs for the material and all, and then he tells me how much his pay should be. So let's say he tells me, you'll owe me a thousand for the paint job. I say, fine, and then I give him uh, 700 rands to buy all the materials. When he's finished, he comes back and he says, I want my thousand. I said, hey, chapnished. I gave you 300 already, uh, or 700 already. I only owe you another 300. He'll say, no, 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 no. What you gave me, the 700, was for the material. The reward for what I worked is still the thousand rands. And that's what the Rambam says. The blessings mentioned in this week's portion are not the rewards for the mitzvahs. Those we will truly get in the future world to come. These blessings refer to the ability to do the Torah and mitzvahs. If God wants us to keep Shabbos, we need the money to keep the Shabbos. And so to all the mitzvahs, to educate your children, as you all know, it costs a lot of uh, school fees to teach our, to our children Torah, to keep kosher costs more, to give tzedakah costs. So all these blessings are the means that we need to fulfill the blessings. The uh, curses, and we have seen them. They are indeed as seven series of seven going one after the other in the most horrific ways, including that you will go into exile and there you will end up uh, serving and your slave will become your master and many others. And including there, it says that Israel, when you go into Israel, it, the country will become desolate and that will be its the, the earth's revenge because you didn't keep Shemitah and Yevil properly when you should have, so the country will become fallow and that was the first 70 years of exile. The first temple's exile was 70 years which works out according to the amount of Shemitahs and Yevils that the Jews were till then. It's interesting to know that the country indeed did become fallow when the Jews de didn't live there. The Israel never be gave crops for anyone else but the Jewish people. You can even read about from Mark Twain. He traveled to Israel and Egypt and wrote about the countries then. And he says, it's like a desert. It's fallow. You look up the history of Israel, as the Torah says, only grew and produced for the Jewish people. At the end, towards the end of the Torah, the Torah says that one thing I promise you, though you go into exile and though you suffer and are persecuted and die there in many, many different ways, I promise you, you will never be annihilated you will always exist as a people. And God says, I will remember my covenant with Yaakov, 
my covenant with Yitzchak and with Avram, I will remember. And I will bring you back to, to the land of Israel. And I will never, ever allow you to become obliterated. And when you think about it, this is one of the greatest miracles in history. You know, they say there was once a German Kaiser who asked his advisor, please give me proof that God exists. And his reply was, the fact that the Jewish people survive through it all is the greatest proof that God Almighty exists. And this is true historically. Many, many nations rose up against us. And as I mentioned in a previous year, it's interesting how many dictatorships felt threatened by the Jews and went out to obliterate them, whether it was true or not true. For example, Stalin, the Nazis, the Romans, and uh, the, the uh, Spanish Inquisition, and many others felt threatened by the Jews and they set up final solutions to destroy them. What happened to those world empires? They're gone. Who remains? We are the only nation throughout history who has re retained itself. There was an English historian by the name of Toynbee, Yemach Shemoy V'Zichroi, and he wrote a whole thesis on the fact that the world works by nations developing, becoming world empires, and then falling apart, destroying, and becoming nil. So someone pointed out to him that that is true about all the other nations. But look, the Jewish people became a strong nation under King Solomon and King David, but they were never destroyed. They still carry on. He says, no, they don't. They said, what do you mean? Look at all the Jews. He says, those are just fossils from a previous country. So Baruch Hashem, we're not fossils. We're thriving, wonderful community who makes such contributions to the world, with Israel especially existing and being at the forefront of everything, which is a validation and a fulfillment of the promise of this week's Parsha that no matter what, God will never destroy us. And then the Torah goes on to the laws of Erchin, which is evaluation. And that is that if you promise to give the value of someone to the temple, then there is, depending on the gender, male or female, and depending on the age, you had a certain price from 30 days to five years, from five to 20, from 20 to 60, and then over 60 when your value went down. Now, Rashi points out that the value of a woman went down proportionately much less than the value of a man in old age. The man's value reduced to, tremendously. A woman's did not. And Rashi says, do you know why that is? It's based on this statement that when you have an old woman in a home, she's a great help to the whole household. When you have a, an old man in the home, he's nothing but a broken vessel. And so you see, a man schleps and makes demands when he's older. A woman helps with the housework, bathing the grandchildren and, and cleaning. But I think us men should stand up against the chauvinism expressed here against us. And the Torah concludes with the laws of Misa, which is a tithing. And that is that the farmers, let's say of sheep, all the baby Shepsalach that were born that year, they would give, put into a pen, and they would let them out one by one. On Rosh Chodesh Elo, the man would stand and count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. As they walked out on the ten, he had a shtecken, a stick with paint, and he would put a paint on the tenth one. And every tithe was holy. And then the Torah said, you mustn't distinguish between the good and bad, and you mustn't substitute them. What does it mean, substitute? If you say, oh, look at this tenth a sheep that came out. It looks thin. It looks crippled. It looks lechy. I will give them a much fatter, better sheep. You mustn't do that. 
just the one that God chose that came out, that should be the Maisa. And the Rambam again discusses what is the rationale for not substituting a, uh, the, one of your better ones for a worse one. And the Rambam says that God Almighty knew human behavior and understood it. And he knew that if he allows you to substitute, at first you'll say you're substituting a better one for the worse one. But the truth is your evil inclination will cause you to take a worse one and substitute for better and say it is. Because when the enthusiasm of doing everything comes, and the enthusiasm of wanting to do the mitzvah, then you're ready to give the best. But when you think about it, you think differently and you want to give a worse one. So the Torah says, remain with that initial enthusiasm, with the desire to do the mitzvah, be the generous person you, want, you can be and do the good. And then the Torah concludes with, we conclude with chazak, chazak, venis chazek. Be strong, be strong, and may we be strengthened. Amen. That is our blessing to all of us, to all of us, to all our friends, to all our people, to Israel, especially as Yom Yerushalayim is this coming Friday, and to the entire world. Chazak, chazak. Let us be strong, let us be strong, and together, nis chazak, let us be strengthened. May God give us the strength. May we get rid of this virus finally and go back to being able to be productive people of society and go forward to redemption with Mashiach. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.